welcome friends to this monthly meeting. Uh, we have this monthly meeting so that we can uh, remember the main purpose of our life, human life, which is to discover why we are here, what's the reason for this creation, and what role do we play when we come to this life. Is there any purpose in being born or reborn again and again? And what is the purpose, if any? We come to get answers to these questions by contemplation of our own self. This meeting is not a religious meeting. The path to discover who you are is not religion. It's the foundation of all religions. All religions wanted to find out if there was a creator who was the creator, how can we have realization of the creator? And all of them said that the pathway to discover the truth of the creator and creation was within yourself. This is the foundation, the founding principle. All religions, all founders of religions whom we worship today, they said the same thing. But we have made separate sets of rules and regulations, separate rituals, ceremonies and divided ourselves and given names to those divisions as religions. The basic principle of discovering yourself within yourself remains the same, never changed. And people have been practicing under various titles, religious or spiritual. The aim is still the same, to find out who are we really, why are we here, what's the purpose? Is there any purpose to human life at all? These are the questions which we all ask ourselves. Yesterday was an important day for me. It was a day of contemplation. Yesterday was the anniversary of my initiation by great master Azur Maharaj Baba Saul Singh. It was 81 years ago, yesterday, that I was initiated. I looked back upon this time. I said, most of my friends are not even 81 years old. And I have had a long innings with the subject of trying to find out if this particular method that he taught of finding yourself within yourself, finding the true self, has it worked? I looked back at my own life yesterday. So that's why it was important. It was a year when um, 81 years ago I was initiated. I have many years in these 81 years where I had doubts. Many years where I tried to practice alternative systems to check out that I, the one I was practicing was the best. I wanted to choose what was the best and the easiest for me. So, these 81 years have been a lot of experimentation for me. And that is why I could look back upon these years and see what can I make of what actually happened. Of course, one thing was clear, that what the great master taught was not any new religion. And why I say this is because I found his own followers and followers of several masters who teach the same thing, saying, I was once a Roman Catholic and now I become so and so follower of a path. I was once following my five namaz as a Muslim, as a Muslim, now I am following this path. I was once a Jewish going to the synagogue and now I am following this path. As if this is another religion that you left one and gone to another. A total mistake. A total misunderstanding. You don't have to change your religion to find out who you are. You don't have to change anything to find out who you are. There is no change in what. All you have to do is to study what the religion has fundamentally said. There is something inside your life form, inside your consciousness. If you can find out what that is, you will get answers to most of your questions. It's a very simple thing. That go within. Go within what? Go within whatever you think is yourself. When we sit here in human bodies and we live in a world that can be perceived through human bodies, we think we are human beings and human bodies. Okay, good start. 
if we think we are human bodies, human beings, born as human babies and grow up as human beings, entire human beings in a body, and we think this body is our self, good start. What do we do then? What can we find the life force within this human body? Can we look into this human body and say, what is making us alive? If the biological systems, if all the tissues of the body were life, then when we see a person dying or dead, all the tissues are completely the same. What has gone out there? Obviously, life is not the biological composition of this body. It's something more. If you want to start from that point of view and say, I do not want to take somebody else's word for anything, which, by the way, is a requirement if you want to follow great master teachings. His teachings are, do not believe anybody, not even a master, but believe your own experience. If somebody suggests something, you can try it. But don't believe it unless you have an experience. Don't believe anything except what experientially you can yourself say, I have experienced. The beauty of this statement is that there are a couple of experiences we are all having, no matter what our religion, no matter what our belief system, no matter whether we believe it or not whether we follow a particular religion or an atheist, it doesn't matter. We all believe that we are existing. That doesn't require proof. There are some experiences in life which are self-evident and we have never asked for that proof. And this is one of them, that we exist. Okay, how do you exist? That investigation starts from something that is already proven to us by our own self-existing experience of being alive and being conscious and being able to think about it and being able to sense, perceive what is around us. These are fundamental facts we all know are proven to us by our daily experience. Let's start from there. That when we think, when we ask a question, who is it in me that is speaking, which is not my body, because if I were dead, the body won't speak. If I am sleeping, the body doesn't speak. If I am unaware under anesthesia, the body doesn't speak. What is it that speaks when I am awake in this body? Where do I speak from? If I shut my mouth, I am still speaking with my thoughts. Where am I thinking? I, can I just look at this simple experience of mine? I am thinking something now. Where am I thinking from? Okay, maybe I'm looking at too many things, so that's disturbing me. I'll close my eyes to be able to find out exactly where I'm thinking from. It's a distraction to be thinking at the same time, seeing something, so I'll close my eyes. Okay, I'm hearing people, I'll close my ears. That means I shut off temporarily and experience that might be distracting me from a basic question that if I am alive, thinking in this body, where do I think from? Then I examine my whole body. I close my eyes. Close my ears. Breathe gently, softly, not to be disturbed. And contemplate, where do I think from? And I look at my toes. No, that's not it. My legs, no. My arms, my hands, no. My heart. Maybe? No. It's not somewhere. My throat? No. Where, where am I thinking from? This does not take more than five minutes of contemplation to know you are thinking in your head. That you are thinking from some place behind your eyes. Your eyes are closed. If you were to say, if I am merely a point of thought, point of thinking machine, where am I? The answer comes, you are sitting in the head behind the eyes. Doesn't take too long. Okay, that narrows the field of investigation about our own self. That if the self is something that is not physical, is not having physical experiences in this physical world, 
but it has the ability to question ask a question and the ability to think about it the ability to wonder about it where does it happen it happens somewhere in the head behind the eyes this does not take very long if somebody can say i think from my heart i'd like to see and put me across set across me and start thinking he come up and say no heart is beating i can feel it it's a physical activity going on in my heart are you feeling any emotions in your heart no even they are there but my heart beats when i am emotional it's a physical response to something that is happening to what i would call my basic unit of consciousness which is making me conscious and alive that's behind the eyes very good start if one can come to this personal experience by mere contemplation where am i operating from when this happens then the field gets narrowed okay let me see what i can see behind the eyes no i can't see behind the eyes because my whole method of seeing was with this physical eyes my physical eyes are so located on the body i can only see outside i can't see what is happening inside no we can see inside that's the next amazing discovery comes that when i imagine something i can imagine with my closed eyes how is that possible when i imagine i see things which eyes are seeing them i can right now with my eyes open or closed see something else with my imagination where is that coming from narrow the field further let me see where we imagine things from knowing it is behind the eyes and we have the power to see without these eyes through imagination okay i'll experiment a little further i close my eyes and imagine that i am seeing something and i know at that time i am not seeing with these eyes i think of something and hear my thought i hear my own thought i think something and i hear it my these ears did not hear that at all these ears were not even involved how come i can see and hear something behind my eyes without the use of anything on the body there must be something more than that one more step who is that that can see and hear which is my own self doing it i know it's me there nobody else there it's my own self that can see and hear behind the eyes and yet it is not this body can i then at least see who that person is who that being is which is my own self and i try to see i can't see myself because i can't see my eyes i can neither see my physical eyes nor can i see the eyes that are seeing inside but i can see my hands i can see my hands here i close my eyes i can even see my hands there that means i have a replica of myself that is physical outside and my imagination creates a replica of myself inside me is it possible that i now proceed to discover myself further with that replica which can see and speak and hear and and use that as the next step to discover who i am it's a very logical way to look at it and when i do that i find a very strange thing happening if i spend time only on what i just described this is no religion this is no this is no particular spiritual path it is discovery of the self then you want to discover what else can you do with that self which is imaginative totally imaginative but functions it's functioning to see touch taste smell it can do everything right inside all the sense perception are there with it let me see can it dance it can can it fly it can what happens to gravity does it have gravity no why not if this body is pulled down by this gravity here why is that not being pulled down by gravity is something different now let me spend some time 
studying that. If you spend time studying that, what will happen? Very interesting experiment. If you study that inner self, your imaginative self, you suddenly find that the study of the imaginative self withdraws your attention from everything else. That's such a great gift we have, which we don't realize, the gift of attention, that we can put our attention wherever we like. We are using it all the time. We read a book, we put our attention on the book. If you put too much attention, we are not familiar who else is around. Because attention is the part of awareness which we can use. There is no other part of awareness that we can use. Let me put it slightly differently. We are conscious beings because we are conscious of the world. We are conscious of ourselves. As conscious beings, we can sometimes be unconscious. Are we ever in con unconscious? If you study consciousness further, you will say, you are never really unconscious. You can switch your consciousness from one state to another. When we go to sleep, we are unconscious of the body. We are unconscious of what is happening here. But we are conscious of a dream state. We are conscious of something else. We wake up, we forget what the dream was. We say, we were unconscious. No, we were unaware. Awareness is a very small section of consciousness. We operate with an awareness. Right now we are sitting in an auditorium here. We are aware there is an auditorium. I am aware there are flowers, beautiful flowers next to me. I enjoy looking at them. I am aware of all that. I am talking to you. I am also aware of the flowers. But my attention is not on the flowers. Awareness and I, this awareness of the flowers will not change. But I can put more attention on you. I won't be aware of this. Awareness is controlled by the use of our attention. Attention is the one which has, is like a probe. You can put it any part of awareness that you like. It's such a remarkable gift that you can use attention to put wherever you like. It's, a, it's something in your hands. Awareness is not in your hands. Consciousness is not in your hands. The world is not in your hands. It's just there. But where you put your attention is in your hands. It's also another big gift given to us apart from this ability to use attention as part of awareness, we also have a gift of concentrating our attention. If you concentrate your attention on something, you become unaware of other things. Awareness is there, you concentrate it on one thing, the more you concentrate, the more unaware you become of other things. That means your ability to reduce your awareness and intensify it on any particular thing is in your control through not only attention, concentration of attention. And I want to tell you that the teaching of the great master, which I have experimented for 81 years and one day up to today, it involves nothing else except this. Concentration of attention. That's it. When we try to investigate who are we, that can see, fly, dance, do anything inside without the physical body being involved and concentrate our attention on that experience, we become unaware of the world outside and unaware even of the body we are wearing right now. Beautiful experience. Lots of people have had it. Yogis have had it. Meditators of all kinds have had it. Becoming unaware of the body. Out of body experiences. Feeling there is another body that can fly. Totally independent from this body. It's a unique experience all it proves is that what you think is alive is not this, really this body. It's that inner body, the imaginary self, which we say we are just imagining now with the brain. It's that which is giving us an experience that when we bring it back and leave that point and bring it outside, this body becomes alive. And within our awareness, when we pull it up through concentration of attention on the inner body, this virtually disappears in, from our experience and that one opens up. Up to this point, I have met a lot of friends who have done this. But they say, so what? What have you found? Because they don't go to the next step. The next step is, if you can use that body 
to find out what is, where are you operating from in that body, not this. It's easy for step one to get into this experience that you can have by concentration of attention and experience of another self of yours, which is a replica of this one with certain differences in the law in which it operates. It's very interesting that we do not then go to find what else can we do with the inner self we just discovered, where we can go within that too. That's where nobody practices. And I'll explain to you why nobody practices. Nobody practices because we take this experience of the physical reality as the only reality. It's almost a given. When somebody says, tell me what is real, I can see here, I can touch this table, I can drink some water from my cup. Very real. Cup is real. Water is real. I am real. Drink, body is real. This is all, this is the only reality. The rest is imagination. Assumption. A given assumption. A given experience. We can't get out of it. Therefore, because this assumption is grounded in us so strongly, that even when we are meditating and discover the inner self, we cannot go beyond it because we are pulled continuously by the thought we are experimenting in a real body, in a real world here. That's what pulls us down again and again. So many of my friends who say we are searching for our true self have only found their imaginary self and they say true self. That's not the true self at all. It's just another way of experiencing what your consciousness can generate as a nature of your own self. That's all. You're not found much by doing that. So that is why it's very difficult. Supposing I was sleeping and we all sleep and dream and we all dream. Supposing in the dream I find this table and I find this cup of water there. And I say, I am going to test, is this water real or not? And I do exactly the same thing. Another sip of water. Hmm. Absolutely real. Taste is good. Water is real. Cup is real. And I wake up. There was no cup. There was no water. But something was there. The taste of water was still in my mouth. We must realize that the dream created an experience of me drinking water from a cup. Neither the cup was there nor the water was there. The drinking of the taste was still there. The experience was real. What I attributed the experience to was not there. This is the same mistake we make here. Exactly the same mistake. We attribute our experiences in this world to objects which we identify with, little realizing the objects are coming into being because of our state of consciousness and because we then imagine that the only reality, the objects are real. Experience came because of the objects. Supposing we one day woke up from this wakeful state and discovered, wow, all that was just a dream, that's such a big dream, and all those people were dream creatures. And that world itself was dream. And I thought all the experiences was because of those people. What will be my conclusion at that time? My conclusion will be the experience was real. The objects were not. My meeting the people was real. But the people were not. It's a very, very startling thing one gets, comes to know. If you can sustain that experience, you will find much to your surprise that we are generating what looks like a three, four, five dimensional existence around ourselves. We are generating from the experience of that. Experience is real. The objects and things that appear in that experience are not. This question has been asked for a long time actually and they put it very simply. You see a tree. Do you see a tree because it is there or the tree is there because you are seeing it? It's the same question has been asked. Do you have 
and experience of this physical creation because it is physically created and you have the ability to have sense perceptions of it or your sense perceptions are creating them. I was surprised to see some articles in scientific magazines these days which are saying that most likely, this is the latest thinking in physics, most likely what we see is not real. The seeing of it is creating it what's real. This has been a big, big blow to traditional physics by this quantum mechanics and all that, which says that things are different till you observe it. When you observe, they become different. Is that the power of observation? Of course, even Einstein, in the last notes that you, if you read, he says, I did not pay uh, sufficient attention to the role of an observer in the scientific experiment he was doing. Because we used to draw, I was a student, I graduated in physics and chemistry also. So we used to draw in those days the structure of an atom, say hydrogen atom. We put a little nucleus, a pro proton in the middle and, a nu and an electron moving around it. You put it anywhere, this electron. But when you think of it, if there is one in the hydrogen atom, in the hydrogen atom there is only one electron. One electron can move in any orbit. We know the distance of that electron from its nucleus. We measure it nowadays, it's easy to measure. So we've been able to measure how far the electron is from its nucleus orbiting around it. But it can orbit in this circle, it can orbit like this. There are a million ways it can orbit. Why did we put it in one place? Today they rejected that model. That model of expressing an atom has been rejected in physics today. What they say is, is a cloud. In that cloud, the atom is at one place somewhere. Where is it? Where you observe it. Supposing you observe it, it's at that point. After that, it remains at that point. Your observation makes a hydrogen atom what it is, what we were drawing pictures of. Before that, you can't draw it. Amazing. This is true. Not one. Thousands of experiments have been done to prove this right. Which means the power of observation, the power of measurement, the power of interference by human observation is creating what we are seeing. Well, this is, this is something new to physics. Very old to spirituality very old to the spiritual truth about the self. And the self through consciousness creates all the experiences. But we think the experiencer is only having an experience of something already existing. When they say, when you look at a tree, is the tree there because you look at it or you can look at it because it is already there? Is The materialists say, tree has to be there otherwise you can't see it. Idealists say you have the ability to create a tree with your consciousness and you're creating a tree, therefore you're seeing it. The mathematician says there is no big problem. It's a question of cause and effect. You want to know is the tree the cause and you're seeing the effect or seeing, the, seeing is the cause and the tree is the effect. Very easy. Whatever comes first is cause. Whatever comes later is the effect. If you don't bring the tree in front of you, you won't see it. Therefore, the tree is the cause and you are seeing the effect by seeing it. But bringing the tree in front is part of the same experience as the tree. It's not separate from it. Okay, let's put the two together and examine what comes first, the tree or the seeing of the tree. Measurements have been done several times. They are simultaneous. There is no time lag, not even a nanosecond time lag between a tree and the seeing of the tree. Therefore, the puzzle remains unsolved. You can't figure it out by that formula of cause and effect. Therefore, there must be some other way to find out. Now, if you are investigating who you are and you go within yourself, you discover that what is inside you 
through which you use imagination and use all five sensory perceptions as good as the ones you're using with the physical sensory organs on your body. And if you go within that, which very few people do, I want to encourage them to do. I want to teach them how to do. That's the, that's the secret of discovering further. What else is there that is making that imaginary self come into being? When you go within that, there you discover that the patterns of what you have been seeing through physical body are pre-existing there. That's a, big, a very big revelation. It's all, it's all an internal experience, personal experience. It's not, you're not reading books about it. You're not re hearing stories from somebody. It's your own personal experience you are having. That when you go within that, in the same way, like you went to the imaginary self in this body, behind the eyes, if you go behind the eyes of the inner self, you discover that the patterns of all creation that you ever observed are li lying down there. You will also observe something very, very strange. You will see what is the nature of time and space. Scientists are still investigating. Is one big problem. What is time space? Yesterday I read good news for me to understand what they are talking about because when I was studying, graduating in BSc Physics 1943, I remember the professor of physics in the class said that this whole world is made of atoms and atoms are merely electrons moving around the nucleus. And between them is space. If space is pulled out, that professor said, this whole earth of ours, big planet, will become like a football. Very impressive statement. In the 60s, 20 years later, I was at Harvard University in the United States and a professor of physics and astronomy was giving a talk he said, this whole thing is space. If space is pulled out, it will become like a marble. I said, football has become a marble now. In the 80s, I heard from another scientist. If the space is pulled out, it will become like a pinhead. Yesterday, I heard space is pulled out, there will be nothing left. Are we all space? Let me. Are we all space time? If that is what the scientists are saying, Yes, we are. Once there was a, a master in India. I was holding an important position in government as the chief secretary of a state government. There was another colleague of mine, chief secretary of another state. He was following a different master. But we used to compare notes once in a while work together. He said, I want to bring my master to see you. I said, most welcome. So his master came in my office. And he said, I have heard from my disciple that you are also a great seeker of the truth. I have come to initiate you. I said, sir, I am already initiated by my master who has taught me the way of discovering the self through certain means of practice. And I am fo following it. Looks like it is working to some extent. He said, there is no good to be working on something to discover a truth. Truth is truth. You should know it or not know it. How can you be working on it? I give you the truth. You don't have to work on it. If you think God is the truth, I will show you God right now. I show God instantly when I initiate somebody. I said, sir, I must tell you the kind of person that I am. Very patient. I am willing to wait to see God. I am in no hurry. He said, no, but I will initiate you anyway. All right, most welcome. So he initiated me. Now, if I describe the initiation, you will all get initiated. You don't mind, then you can join me. I would explain the initiation. He said, hold your hands like this. So I held my hands like this. He said, join your hands. Separate them. Tell me what you see between the hands. I did close the hand, then I opened. What do you see? I said, I see nothing. He said, that's it. 
the origin of everything is nothing. But it's not really nothing. If you really try to explain, don't you think there is something? If it was nothing, what did you do like this? There is some space I can see here. He said, that's the creator. In my mind at that time, I got a little amused at this initiation. At night, I realized he told me the truth. Scientists are saying that. If space is pulled out, the whole world disappears. It we creatures of space. Space-time is the only thing that's creating all our experiences here. And science is saying this, not metaphysics. Of course, metaphysics has been saying all the time that consciousness generates through the mind the experience of time-space. Can we check that out, that statement? By the experience that we can have within ourselves. Yes. If you meditate upon yourself, the inner imaginary self, and meditate within that imaginary self, behind the eyes of the imaginary self, you discover how space and time are generated and how all events are placed in that. The building blocks of our experience are generated there. After that, you don't need to ask anybody else how this world is created. It's your experience. This is the beauty of the teaching of my master. That he said, only believe what you can personally experience. I can guide you, he said, how to get to that point. But it has to be your experience, you believe it. You can go further than that. All this discovery of space-time, the creation of space-time, the creation of this universe, the creation of cause and effect, the creation of time. You can, of course, intellectually imagine that when there was no space-time, we packed whole lot of events, whole lot of objects into a zero time, zero place, which we can call a very heavily loaded nothing and then exploded it and became everything. And that's what the scientists are talking about, the Big Bang. They say there is black hole. Only 10 years ago, the black hole was considered to be something that has no, no volume. But immense mass, so much mass it could all come out, a very heavy nothing. And when it explodes, everything comes out of it. And they think our world has been created from a big bang which must have been a black hole in which everything was pre-existing. Big problem is coming in that theory, you know that? We are getting better and better telescopes today. For those people interested in science, modern science, you'll be very interested to find that we are finding such nice electron telescopes which can see billions of light years away. Every time we can see further, we see the world is bigger than we thought. In one billion light years, that means when you say something is one billion light years away from us in space, it means we are seeing something that was there one billion years ago. You can never see what is there now. Because Einsteinian belief, which is still accepted that nothing can move faster than the velocity of light, that the light takes so much time to come here, when we are seeing a lighted object in the sky, if it is one billion light years away, that means it has taken one billion years to come to us. We are, what we are seeing was what it was one billion years ago. They have calculated the origin of this universe. And I am comparing these things with our knowledge that we get through our own experiences inside and how they are talking like this and why they are talking and where it's coming from. When they say, this is an expanding universe, how do they know? It's an expanding universe because every year they look at the galaxies outside our Milky Galaxy, outside of our own Milky Way and they see they are moving away. They are moving away in every direction which first creates a big problem that in the north is moving, south is moving away, east is moving away, west moving away, up it's moving away, down it's moving away. Are we the center of this universe? If everything is moving away around us, is one little planet, one earth, in one solar system, in one little corner of a milky galaxy, the center of the whole universe, that everything is moving away from us, where we are? Very difficult for them to explain this phenomenon till they came to a very 
weird kind of conclusion that everything is moving away from everywhere. Okay, so there is no center. The whole universe is the center. Very difficult to explain. We, our concept of center is not what they are saying now. But the biggest difficulty is coming now that we have examined now for several years the rate of expansion, the rate of moving away and worked backwards to find out when would it start to be contracting at the same rate and we pegged it down to 13.5 billion years ago the Big Bang started and this universe came into being. They pinpoint the number. 13.5, 13.4 billion years ago there was nothing. No time, no space, no universe and suddenly a Big Bang took place and this whole universe has come into being and is expanding ever since. But when we look through telescopes, good telescopes, and look one billion light years away, the world is bigger than this. Two billion light years away, even bigger. What will happen? We are almost close to going to 13.5 billion light years away. The world is huge. Where, is the, where did the Big Bang start from? See, so big problem coming up very soon. So it's very difficult to reconcile so many things that are actually being observed with the theoretical model that we have been setting up. But many more answers and answers that explain these things can be found if you can go within to the nature of consciousness itself and discover why these experiences are taking place. So that's a beautiful thing that you not only discover who you are, you discover your experiences, the reality of your experiences, just by going within your own self. It's a, it's a great thing if you can meditate within yourself and you discover the nature of time space being created. You can go even beyond that. To go beyond that is not part of your effort. And that's a big snag in this whole thing. We, because of our mental thinking, believe that everything we can do ourselves if we have to. And there are some things come up which we can't do. Which is unfortunate. The reason for this is that our whole idea of achieving something is based upon our mind. Our mind says you have to work something to get something. Although we have many experiences where we never work and we still get it. I'll give you examples. But we think that we have to work for getting everything. We believe if we have to find God, we have to work for it. I have not come across any person, I must tell you, truthfully, I have not found any person who worked and found God. But I have found people who say that we are in communion with God without working for it. So there must be something else that works beyond our own effort. There must be something that is beyond our own mind. If you study your life in this world and say, I have a mind that makes me think. What else does it do? What does my mind do besides thinking? It uses thinking to rationalize things. It uses thinking to make sense of things. He uses thinking to understand things. All these things that I have just mentioned take place in time. You cannot have any thought without a duration attached to it. Yet there are experiences we are having which do not have duration. The most important of which is the experience of love. You fall in love. How much time does it take? Has anybody ever studied? You, I'm not talking of thinking about falling in love. I'm not talking about what happens when you fall in love and think what has happened. That's mind. But the experience of love for somebody, does it take any duration? No. Study carefully. Love is an experience so instantaneous, just feel at once. And sometimes you can't even find a cause for it as if it is not following the law of cause and effect. It's not mental. Therefore, that means something else is operating in us that creates that experience. Second experience, intuitive knowing something. I just know. 
You get this feeling. All of us get this intuitive feeling. No duration. No time. How can it be mental? There's no thought involved. Appreciation of beauty. I just look at it beautiful. Am I examining? Does it take time? Which are the colors of the flowers or what? No. I can then apply my mind on the experience that I've had. But these experiences of love, intuition, the beauty, appreciation of that, these do not occur in mind or in space-time or in the laws of cause and effect. But commenting upon them later on in our mind is a mental activity. Where do these take place? That's the study that takes place when you understand the limits of your mind. Limits of the mind can be understood by contemplating how far the mind can go or by visiting inside. You will discover that the imaginary self that you were talking of as number one stage was merely a set of sense perceptions that are working independently from the body. When you go further inside, you'll find that what is working, the thoughts that are creating, are working independently from the sense perceptions, independently from the body. We have three forms right sitting here. We have physical body, we have sense perceptions independently working inside and overlapping this body to create a feeling that they are in this body. We have a mind that is thinking inside independently and we think it's tied up with the sense perception and tied up with the physical body. But they can function independently if you become unaware of the external body or sense perceptions through the practice of concentration of attention on the mind. It's a simple practice. And these are actual experiences you can have. You don't need anybody else's proof. Proof is your own experience. I said that we feel we are existing we know we are existing. We are sure we are existing. Is there anything else we can be equally sure of? Yes, I can tell you one more example. When we go to sleep at night, we are unaware of our body. In the morning we wake up, we are sure we are awake. We don't test if we are awake or not. We don't move our hands, don't pinch ourselves, are we awake? We don't call for evidence. Am I awake? Supposing 1,000 people were standing next to you said, you are still sleeping. said, no, I know I am awake. What makes you so certain? What is, the, what is the reason for so much certainty that you are awake when you wake up in the morning and you don't even open your eyes? You don't even move. You know you are awake. That you were sleeping, now you are awake. It's a confirmation of our own state with so much proof in itself. That nobody's proof is required. What's the secret of this? Secret is when you wake up, you remember you went to sleep. Study it. That's the only reason. When you wake up, you remember you went to sleep. You recall with the previous state of being guarantees and a proof, self-evident proof that you are awake. If you can really wake to a higher level of awareness, wouldn't that proof also apply? It's the same proof that applies. When you awake to a higher level of awareness and cut off and discover this one like a dream, the proof lies in that wakefulness because you connect yourself as you were already there before you came here. This experience of knowing that you were already in that state, which was not a physical state, that you were there before you became physical. And that wakefulness of that state carries its own proof. And somebody says, can you prove that it's real? Of course you can't prove. But you have the proof yourself. But I was at Harvard University. I, was, I went to study economics and global marketing and business and whatnot. But... Because I gave a few talks like this, which I am sharing with you, the professors of the Department of Physics, uh, Philosophy, Philosophy, Metaphysics, Parapsychology, they would come and discuss with me. They said to me, Mr. Puri, remember, our mind is very powerful. If you give a suggestion to it, it begins to make a whole reality out of it. What do the hypnotists do? They hypnotize you. The power of suggestion. You can also have auto-suggestion. 
they told me, we believe you are experiencing a state of auto-suggestion. As you are saying, because your master, somebody told you there are these higher re regions and you wake into higher levels and therefore you, subject to their power of suggestion and your own auto power of suggestion are all imagining and seeing things. Mind is capable of that. Don't you think this is possible? I said, certainly it's possible. I very surely believe in the power of suggestion. I surely believe I could be doing this a lot of suggestion. I'm not denying it, but only one thing I can tell you, that ever since I have practiced this auto-suggestion, I've been a very happy person. People marvel how happy I can be, and I myself marvel how I can be happy all the time with the auto-suggestion I did. You people are taking Prozac and whatnot, and I know it. You're depressed. You're depressed by thought of the very auto-suggestion which is helping me. I think I told them. I believe this kind of auto-suggestion should be sold to people because people are all searching for happiness. If you really look at the quest for what people are looking for, they're looking for happiness. And if such a simple thing, like an auto-suggestion, can make you that happy and make you so confident about everything. And I said, sometimes you feel that if a person has been misled by power of suggestion, is going the wrong track. And he's mad, insane. A lot of the mystics who came were very close to either being called highly enlightened or insane. And the difference was very little between the two because they were talking like insane people. So far as the sanity of our existing world and assumptions is correct. But I said, I got an A plus in one of your papers here. That's very, not very difficult for a guy who is doing auto-suggestion and living in a world of his own. And that was a paper in a subject that I never said it before. So there must be some benefit, even externally. I said, maybe you don't know, I had a career in, in my own country where I rose to the top and made many people jealous by getting some double promotions. And this auto-suggestion helped me all the way. Not only spiritually, it helped me physically and materially. Don't you think it's a good thing? You can, the mind can put all doubts. Why I could laugh at their questions was because I had put these doubts to myself when I was much younger. I had put all the doubts to myself. Today somebody comes and says there's an alternative way of looking at it. I'm willing to look at it. If somebody were to come and tell me there is something more to get by a different method and approach, I'm willing to follow even today. I'm not willing to follow merely because I'm interested in it. My own master told me that what he is sharing with me, he found useful and he found it worked. And if I can find something better, I should take something better. But he also said, if you find something better, come and tell me, he will also take it. It's so open. This is not something, it's not a cult or something that you are now bound and closed down and then practice this. It's an investigation, open investigation of your own self. I remember another uh, professor, he was, he was practicing some psychological tests on people, professor of psychology, and they were doing some tests and measuring, they tried to measure thoughts, a very difficult new subject they were try, attempting at Harvard. And he told me that we, we conduct tests, whether it's physics or chemistry or anything, we have all labs set up, very well-controlled labs. And that's how we test it, objectively, empirically, so people can see it. You talking of something that goes in your own head, that's not scientific. I said, if you can for one moment take your head as your lab, would it not be scientific? Apply the same rules. Same rules that you apply to your lab, you make it scientific, no breeze should come to interfere with your weight measuring. You make this head identical with that, wouldn't it become scientific? It was hard for them to accept. But when we began to compare, note that we are 
experimenting in our own physical head to examine what is there is as scientific as their experiments. You can find, do exactly the same. Don't start with an assumption which can be questioned. The problem arises that we make assumptions even in the best of scientific investigation we make assumptions which have to be broken away ultimately. When we are studying who we really are which is the subject of this whole conversation with you. Who we really, what's our rule, really truth, who we are, why are we having this experience? To find the answers to that, which you can find within yourself, the assumption we are making, and we are all making, and very difficult to get out of, is that time is a reality. You can't get out of it. We are saying, what was in the beginning? If there's no time, there's no beginning. And we can't think of something without a beginning. We are questioning, how did this world come into being? When did it come into being? If there was no when, how can you answer this question? Our assumptions right now are assumptions that time and space have always been there. No matter how far you go, everything is happening within that. It's creating a very big hurdle to our investigation. And that is why if you have, make no assumption, be willing to question everything, then go with it. You got the answers to all your questions. I said that there are some things that with your mental effort you cannot do. And those are very important if you want to have the highest realization of who you are. I mentioned the experience of love. You cannot say, I just want to love and make, think about it and create it. It doesn't happen. Very often, if the love is there, by thinking about it, we can destroy it. Many people do it, but we don't create it. If love is so important a factor and not within our hands, do you think it plays a role in our discovery of our own self? If you cross the level of your mind, you will find that's the most important thing. Love pulls you into an area of experience which is beyond time space. Love pulls you into an area of experience which it does not follow in order of cause and effect. And that can only be experienced when it is a sustained love that never changes. A sustained experience of love, starting from where we are now and continuing through every level of experience that we get through our own experimentation and going beyond the mind where we stop thinking and love still stays there. That love pulls you. If you really want to know what's the role of a master, the role of a guru, the role of a murshid, murshid a common, perfect living master, what is the role of a human being who comes and says, I guide you how to do it? A guidance that can be read in books also, a guidance that can be found from anywhere. What is his role? His role is to give us an experience of love so unconditional, so sustained, that it takes you even when you are there and his presence can be felt and pull you beyond the mind. That's the real role. The rest is all a game. The rest is all a mental game being played out here. This is the best thing you will find if you were to discover who you are inside. I'll take a break for a little lunch now, snacks, and uh, I think some of you brought some. Enjoy them. 3.30, I'll see you again.